Welcome, everybody. I've got Derek with me, and we're here to talk about building decks for Star Trek CCG. This is something I know nothing about. <laughs> so I wanted to bring on somebody who's built a number of Star Trek decks. Uh, he helped with our tier list earlier. So Derek, welcome back to the, the show. So what are we going to cover today? Well, thanks for having me back, Matt. Uh, hopefully, if those that didn't get to watch the video, go watch that video from last time. But this time, I've got my uh, voice, um, <laughs> not the bad cough. Uh, so this will be a, hopefully a little bit more uh, enjoyable for all of the listeners out there. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk through first edition, um, not to be confused between the two editions. Um, we'll talk a bit of first edition here, talk a little bit about um, some things to consider when building, uh, really, because you got to build two types of decks, right? You have to build a C deck and a draw deck. And right. there's a lot of, you know, a lot of cards out there. Even if you just consider the original Decipher print, not even including any of the virtual cards that the Trek CC does or if people have done through Dream Cards. Uh, if you exclude those, you're still talking, you know, like two, 2,500 or 3,000 cards um, that were printed in the first edition set. So uh, there's a lot of stuff and we got a lot of people, you know, since COVID came back, um, a lot of people that are, you know, really interested. So um, hopefully we'll talk shop a little bit of how you can help uh, build your build your deck. Okay, so the first step, seed phase. What is a seed phase? I mean, I, I know in concept, but what do we need to do here to, to <laughs> have a successful seed phase? Yeah. Well, uh, let me let me real kick back real quick too, because there's different types of formats you can actually play before we even talk seed phase. Um, because with the formats, there's, you know, people like to play different ways, right? So uh, there's kind of the traditional, which is just going to be decipher only, or there can be basically complete, which is going to be, you know, again, people that like maybe to use the virtual cards uh, that the Trek CC has put over throughout the years since 2006. Um, and then there's going to be different types because um, you're going to have kind of what they've called now the modern, um, which is, you know, a little bit more uh, Magic the Gathering term, <laughs> or what a lot of other uh, more newer card types do. It used to be official tournament format, uh, which is OTF, um, but Modern's the more uh, typical format where there's going to be banned cards and stuff. But there's also a lot of fun stuff, like if you're doing draft or OTSD, official tournament seal draft, which a lot of people remember are those, you know, big cube boxes um, that Decipher did for their for their three main uh, product launches of Star Trek, Star Wars, and Lord of the Rings, um, which was great for just playing right out of the box, right? Um, but in this format, we're going to do um, basically complete. So that's going to be including the concept of including virtual cards through that, um, and then also going to be with the ban list. Um, so that would be the modern format. Since again, if you know most folks want to play in tournaments, and again, those that want to play at the kitchen table, you can make whatever rules you want up, right? You can have even limited card types, right? Because in Star Trek, other than during the seed phase, uh, you know, you can have unlimited amounts of cards in your deck of what you want to do. So, um, but that's just to kind of start with the format a little bit. Okay. So seed phase for complete. Yep. What are some of the key components here? So um, the biggest thing for the game, obviously, in order to win is you got to score points right in order to get to 100 um to get a full win beat your opponent uh and then you could do missions so missions is really the best way of doing it you can get bonus points through objectives um some incidents scenarios on certain cards that will give you bonus points um, unless if you're playing the borg um, which by this uh standard is its own we'll do borg on its own if we ever want to do one if there's enough interest so this is not including the borg affiliation um but you score through missions um, and the biggest thing to remember is most of the time in a complete um, uh, standard format, you're probably going to have some type of ratio um, for missions because you have to score doing a planet and a space mission. And then any combination afterwards, if you want to do two, uh, two uh, space or two planet with then one of the other, uh, perfectly fine as long as you get 100 points or you can score 50 um, or more points from the missions and then score the rest bonus points. So I like to typically do about four planet in two space because most people will know planets a little bit more easier to plan because you can kind of send your teams down and away team little, you know, uh, pods, essentially you're not committing your ship um, because there's a lot of dangerous uh, dilemmas out there that can, you know, wipe out your whole crew and if not your whole ship. Um, and ships are pretty valuable in this game, right? Because that's how you basically get to move for the most part from mission to mission, right? Depending on where your facility is at, 
or where you're reporting your crew, yeah, you're you're at that mission. But to move forward after you know round three, round four to go to the next mission, you're going to need some type of transport. Not everybody's able to play a bunch of ships, so um, I like that ratio. Plus, there's also a card a, a card called Balancing Act that if you had more than um, if you had a ratio of like four to two in either direction, you're fine. But if you had three or more of the other type of, of mission versus space, I'm sorry, planet versus space or space versus planet, you lost 50 points. So if you had like five um, space and one planet, you would lose 50 points if you had that dilemma get revealed during your mission attempt. So most people try to go around the two to four ratio, even three, three. Um, a couple other factors to consider that's very important in this is uh, in standard complete, um, you can't steal your mission's opponents unless if they're worth more than 40 or more points. And that has to be a four zero printed. That's not like any with the X multipliers or the little asterisks or anything like that it has to be 40 or more. So a lot of people like to do 35 or less on their missions because then your opponent can't steal. Obviously, that's really one of the fun things in open um, is to be able to steal your opponent's missions. And again, that's what makes draft and sealed events fun. Um, but, you know, again, with, you know, trying to prevent a negative player experience, NPE for short, um, you know, that was one of the rules that they had where you couldn't just steal your opponent's missions unless if it was a high value or more. And then the last thing to consider for missions is regions. So when you're doing your missions, right, you would have to um, face them face down and then each person lays one at a time um, and basically help building your uh, space line. Uh, you also have to consider quadrants, too, because there's multiple quadrants because you could have the alpha quadrant. You could have the um, delta quadrant. You could have the gamma quadrant and you could have the mirror quadrant. <laughs> So you can have a huge, massive board. So understanding one, you know, part of the of what you're going to play affiliation does kind of help direct which missions you're going to use, right? Because you also need missions that have your little icon of affiliation to attempt it. But those are really what you want to kind of consider um, with that. I like doing a lot of regions just because you um, in a region, no matter when you're um, flipping them over and turning them, you have to play them next to your other region. So it kind of helps keep your space line not as random because you're able to control if it's going left or right. So uh, once you uh, build up your missions, then that kind of understands, okay, Hey, these are the one, these six cards I'm going to play with. So the next thing you're really going to do to help with your seed phase is the doorways. Um, so you're going to have 30 cards in your seed phase. Or, I'm sorry, seed deck. I like to consider a couple of things when I'm kind of starting off from it. Uh, I like to look at the ability to kind of have a nice ratio of dilemmas to non-dilemmas. Uh, usually I liked about 18 dilemmas because if your opponent has six missions, putting three under each is kind of the, I would say, standard way <laughs> in standard format um, to be making sure that you kind of have a good amount of dilemmas because you really don't always know which uh, missions your opponent's going to attempt, right? So I like to look at that kind of a 12, 18, not to say we can't go more, can't go less either way of dilemmas versus non-dilemmas, but that's kind of at least my starting point. So looking at my non-dilemmas to start off with would be your doorways. Uh, you don't have to play with doorways. Uh, it's not a requirement, but there's some really powerful mechanisms, mechanics to the game that all, you know, the doorways open up um, some things to you know, list off the top. Anything that has the alternate universe icon um, needs a doorway to be able to play those cards. They can't just play to the current timeline. So you need that icon out there. Uh, you also would need uh, if you're going to do something that uh, requires a <clears throat> Uh, I'm trying to think of the the other uh, doorway that I'm thinking of at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry, the uh, Battle Bridge um, tactic cards, which are huge in if you're best you're going to have a deck that's going to be a bit more engaging and confrontational or planning to blow up your opponent's spaceships. Um, you're going to look at using tactics um, because they definitely help bring uh, a bit more advantage. It's not necessarily something that both players have to be using. So, you know, if you're not going to be something that's really focused on heavy with uh, space battle don't play with tactics uh but again that might be something that uh you're you know you want to be prepared for in case your opponent's going to play um one of the other really cool uh side decks out there that's played during the doorway phase um is going to be q's tent 
Uh, this is basically kind of its own little mini sideboard within your game. Uh, in your draw deck, even during um, actions during uh, the seed phase, stuff like that, you may not want to pull, uh, you know, populate your deck with cards that are kind of one off based off, especially having another card in play that may require a download. Uh, so a lot of times people will use their cues, oops, their cues uh, tent for the ability to keep some of those uh, one-off downloadable cards in there. So it's not floating up your draw deck. So that's usually kind of where I say one to two uh, doorways is typically the standard that I would play with. But again, some people play with none. Some people play with a bunch. Um, there's even another cues tent that um, the <clears throat> Trek CC came out with that basically allowed uh, the referee cards which were kind of like those silver, silver bullets, uh, defensive shields for if you know those are that are familiar with Star Wars uh, CCG. Uh, the ref cards basically, you know, helped kind of have some silver bullets for some of those NPE cards that Decipher didn't ban. Uh, so having them in there was really nice. Uh, the nice thing that Trek CC has been doing over the years, though, is trying to get rid of those ref cards. So some of the cards that were uh, referee cards ended up uh, just becoming general rules, which was nice, which is really based around um, the balance of having one planet, one space mission you had to solve. You couldn't have more than 50 percent of your um, winning points be more than uh, bonus points. So you had to at least score mission points that way. Uh, those that were in the uh, unfortunately, the gamma and the mirror quadrant get a little um, bit of um, the the short end of the stick, but really because of the Delta Quadrant, when we talked about member in our tier list, the Voyager sets and everything just were really super powerful. Um, one of the things to help prevent them from um, being aggressive was having to score 140 points in the Gamma Quadrant. I'm sorry, Delta Quadrant, uh, which be, then just became a rule rather than a referee card. So that was really nice. Um, so anyways, that... Um, Q's Tent Civil War has really become a less frequently used card because it also had some restrictions on it for the way your play style was. So that's nice to seeing a lot of people just using a regular Q's Tent or no Q's Tent uh, referee side deck anymore. Um, but anyways, uh, doorways are really key and important. You're going to play that, you know, right after your missions to basically open up your doorways. And then that's what's going to allow you to start playing those cards, um, whether they're in your C deck or your draw deck. So I have a quick question here. Yep. How long does the seed phase normally take? It feels like in games that I've played, the seed phase was like 30 to 40 minutes. And is that normal or is it just like because I'm a newbie? That was the old way of playing it. So um, again, if you're playing people that um, from a, a traditional card pool with you know cards that would be now banned, considered like some overpower cards, cards that, you know, like spatial um, uh, scissor, or what was, I can't remember, where it basically allowed you to play like two of every unique card in your, in the, in the Delta Quadrant. So like all the OP <laughs> Voyager crew, you could play two or three of them in your deck or on the table. Uh, uniqueness rules went out the door, cloning, you know, cloning machine, all that stuff. Uh, that would be one of the things because you could literally win turn one. So if you were fortunate enough to go turn one, you could, if you got the right setup and your opponent didn't, you know, seed the right dilemmas and whatever particular order at that particular mission you were actually planning to attempt and you had all the right cards, you could literally, literally uh, win turn one. Um, mm -hmm. So nowadays, um, the standard is probably around 10 minutes. Um, it could go a little bit quicker. Uh, it could go a little bit slower. It depends, right? Um, but usually around 10 minutes uh, because one of the other things too is that they allowed to do is when we would be talking dilemmas next, um, you don't have to alternate back and forth unless if you're seeding dilemmas or um, other seedable cards at the same mission. Otherwise, you're just batch seeding your dilemmas and so I don't have to wait for you. So if I, you know, want to, you know, spend a few minutes on, okay, these dilemmas I want to put here based off your space mission and the space line and all that. Yeah. That's usually where most of the time comes because you're trying to figure out that kind of chess move, right? You know, where you put your dilemmas is going to be crucial. So that's usually where it's about five to six minutes um, where you're just kind of deciding where you need to put stuff um, based off the way the space line is and based off what missions I see. Once that happens, then the rest of that is just, you know, flipping over one at a time, the rest of the facilities, incidents, and objectives before you really get to go start playing the game. So I would say about 10 minutes nowadays. Um, so it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. That is really good to hear. I, I, like I said, I've only played a handful of games, so I, I don't really have a lot of experience. So, um, all right. So we got by missions, doorways. I think dilemmas are up next, right? Yeah. So as I mentioned, right, so um, this is 
where I usually like to have about 18 dilemmas because when you're looking at dilemmas, you're looking at about three per, per um, mission underneath your opponent. And that way they're getting about three um, cards that they have to encounter. Right now against Borg, that can be very difficult because Borg can just ignore quite a bit of cards. Um, they're a bit tricky. Uh, so you have to kind of, you know, change your tactics up. But again, for this, <laughs> uh, conversation, let's kind of skip Borg though. It is something the important to realize that in your local area, if you're seeing a lot of Borg play, then it's again, something you're going to tech against. Um, but for dilemmas here, uh, you know, typically, you're going to notice in the icons, right? You have uh, just like the space in the mission, you'll have uh, dilemmas that can only be seated uh, under space missions, ones that can be uh, seated only under uh, planet missions. And then there's the dual dilemmas, which can be seated uh, either, uh, either or um, depending on what it is. So most people, again, based off that ratio of missions. So even if my opponent played four space and two planet, and I did four planet and two space, most people are only going to include maybe a handful of planet, a handful of space, and then the rest are all going to be dual because that way you're protecting yourself. Because for example, let's say I had out of my 18 missions, I had um, 15 of them planet and only three space and my planet uh, plays four uh, space missions. You could be really screwed because you're only going to be able to seed three space missions or uh, three dilemmas under their total of four space missions. So you have to be very critical on how you're picking dilemmas. So usually, most of the time, it's five to six planet, five to six space, and then the rest are dual. And then the way you want to seed them and the way you want to build your your combos is typically you would like to have some type of combination of either filter, filter wall, or a wall filter wall. And what I mean be, mean by that is a, a wall is going to have a um, <clears throat> an objective to pass that dilemma. And if you don't, when your opponent's attempting that and they fail that um, dilemma, uh, basically it stops their team. And typically that's good because you want to prevent them from you know solving the mission, but you really want to try and get that dilemma to go back under. It's not like in some instances where people have it where, oh, you encountered that, it gets discarded or it goes somewhere else. Some cards do do that, right? Some of them are really powerful, have a good stop, and you have to discard the dilemma. Um, even if it just stops the team, that's great. Uh, but normally you like to have the ability for if my opponent doesn't have something to complete the wall, I want it to go back under. Um, it could be also where you might have some what they call kill dilemmas. Dilemmas that have the ability to kill personnel, whether it's by choice or most of the time it's random, is ideal because usually most people will attempt a mission with anywhere from, I mean, they could try to, you know, what we used to, used to call red shirt uh, with one personnel <laughs> and beam them down and, you know, see what that first dilemma is. And if they die, fine, no big deal. But I'm only sacrificing a, basically a single person. There is a card that kind of prevents that. Basically, they become lost immediately or get shuffled underneath that mission. Um, but if your opponent's not really playing with referee cards or they don't have a whole lot of um, cards that are hidden agendas, essentially hidden, um, then you don't have to worry about that most of the time. So you may go ahead and red shirt. Um, but you know, typically you want something that's not going to be just wasted. So that's why I usually say a wall filter wall is the best combo because that way it forces them to go into with more than just one person and typical wall. Cause usually a wall is going to say like, Hey, you need three or four of this combination skill and maybe so much cunning strength or, um, integrity before you can move on. Right. So if they have to do that, they can't just red shirt it. Um, and then the second one, you want to filter because the filter is going to, per, you know, sometimes, you know, stop certain type of uh, personnel with a skill that you need to basically either complete the mission and or um, hits the next wall, which is going to really have a huge devastating effect, right? Which could wipe out their whole crew or could help you mind, you know, probe them and take over their ship for a turn or two. Um, or again, maybe um, some dilemma um, scenarios you might be building where your whole dilemma is. Um, uh, all your dilemmas are around basically taking one or two specific skills out of the uh, opponent's um, <clears throat> basically skill pool from their, you know, selecting those certain personnel and trying to pick them off. That's usually around like something crazy like exobiology or stellar cartography, which isn't a whole lot. Typically people put in their decks, maybe one or two, maybe three at the most. Um, so if you have those cards removed 
and they can't then completely solve that next dilemma that requires three exobiology, well, they're stuck then, right? So they either can't complete that dilemma and actually then complete that mission, or then they'll have to completely go to another um, location, which then again is taking a whole nother turn or two for them to move to that next mission to then attempt that again. <clears throat> So once you kind of have your dilemmas, um, like I said, I usually like to play around 18. There's a couple of good um, permanent walls like dead end, which basically you could just see that one single dilemma under a mission. And, um, you know, unless if your opponent finally goes after some other missions that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, give them over 50 points, they can't, when they counter dead end, it basically stops them from solving that mission. So they either have to go somewhere else. Let's see. Mm. You're all right. Excuse me. Yeah, I've been uh, doing a lot of talking. <laughs> I should I should talk more. I've just been listening. Right? <laughs> it's okay. But anyways, uh, if you use that mission, that's uh, I'm sorry, that dilemma. On uh, sometimes people just seed that single one, and then they'll be able to either seed uh, some of their extra basically dilemmas of at a ratio of you know three three to one in this case, they get two more that they could splash somewhere else. Or maybe again, that's going to be a couple other cards you'll put in the rest of your seed deck of facilities and incidents, um, incidents or objectives, et cetera. Um, that'll allow you to, you know, grow that other side of the ratio, maybe 16 to 14. All right. So are we, are we finishing up with dilemmas here, moving into facilities, incidents, objectives? Yep. So this is, you know, Basically, like I said, a big chunk of the that 10 to 15 minutes of that seed phase is doing the doorways, doing the missions and doing the dilemmas. Right. Because um, as I mentioned, you know, that's really the, the kind of the art of what you're going to try and stop your opponent, because unlike second edition, which no matter where your opponent is attempting their missions, you're just drawing your your dilemma deck um, cards from there. And that's what you're deciding to um, have them encounter at that time. Basically, the most part is once you see those dilemmas under that specific mission, they're pretty much there for the rest of the game until they're either solved um, or or basically nulled somehow. So this is then, uh, like I mentioned, kind of where I, I usually go about 10 to 12 cards. Um, I usually don't go over 12 if I can prevent it, because like I said, now I'm pulling out of my uh, dilemma pile. So if you have um, one to two doorways, that's part of that 12. So maybe you're now you're down to 10 cards or so. Um, and the rest of your facilities, incidents, objectives. So depending on what type of deck you're going to play, uh, you usually have to have your personnel and chips report somewhere, right? So you most of the time have to have some type of facility. That could be an outpost, that could be a NOR, could be a headquarters, could be a time location. Um, that was one of the cool things that they introduced with uh, Trouble with Tribbles when they introduced the original series. Uh, you have that with the mirror quadrant. They have a, a time objective with that, though they introduce uh, facilities as well and headquarters and wars that you can do in the mirror quadrant. They also did um, in Voyager where you could actually see some of the ships and you could play a certain incident to that ship. And basically, as long as they were a gamma quadrant personnel, they can report to your ship based off their affiliation. Um, so you could be reporting directly to ships. So you kind of get that thematic th uh, feel from it. So depending on, again, what type of affiliation you want to play, um, could be based off, again, some of those earlier um, questions of what you're building with your seed deck. But again, uh, you know, the idea here is, is kind of getting that mixture of, hey, one to two facilities is usually what most people want. Um, and then you're going to do a bunch of incidents and objectives. Uh, as I mentioned the term earlier, hidden agenda where you could have some cards face down as part of that seed phase and they get triggered at certain points in the game when then you're going to reveal them to your opponent or reveal them in some type of, you know, um, action is going to uh, result um, when you flip that card. Um, there's a lot of popular cards that people like to play, uh, specifically Defend Home World, which allows you to download a security personnel, um, you know, directly from, you know, your deck or your hand right into play, um, which is really good. Though it's also a very good defensive card too, especially if your opponent is attacking you at your home planet um, or your home world. Uh, that allows you to basically just dump your entire deck of matching personnel. So it's a really good card to have. Um, could be, again, something <clears throat> that you might have uh, in regards to if you're playing like with the um, Delta um, Quadrant. Like I said, you may, part of that um, is playing the Caretaker's Array 
which then basically gives you the ability to now seed a ship because normally you can't seed ships. So now you've got a second card to seed the ship. And then if you want to play that incident of, like I mentioned, home away from home, which you play on that ship, and now you can report your personnel um, to that ship, get a free report out of it. So that's already three cards um, just to be able to basically allow your personnel to report to a ship to get that, that play engine going, right? Um, there's also some other really cool cards that the Trek CC introduced that I really enjoy, um, which are like continuing mission, which really was a nice power curve for the original uh, TNG property logo cards. Uh, as I mentioned on our tier list, right? Part of the, the issue um, with card games that go on for many years is the later sets typically have this power creep, right? And a lot of the TNG first sets really lost um, their luster, even though like, for example, the Federation had some really powerful five, six scale personnel like John Luke Picard and William T. Riker, right? A lot of the people that, um, that know the TNG <clears throat> main bit, uh, bridge crew, even the Deep Space Nine folks like Cisco and Kira, Odo had some good skills, but compared to the Voyager, they just didn't compare. Like, because the Voyager has a lot of double skills, their their attributes are really strong all the way around. They're almost like Data, just every one of them walking around. It's like, ah, this is not quite uh, thematic anymore. So, continuing mission, for example, allowed certain cards um, for your ships and your personnel, as long as they had the TNG, the the next generation property logo. You could play that card as a play engine. Um, you got to play a certain affiliation card that goes with it based off if it was the Feds, the Klingons, the Romulans, some cool attributes. You got to uh, add an additional draw card. So some really powerful incidents were made that basically allowed some of the older cards, older factions, affiliations uh, to be a bit more uh, more up to par with the Delta Quadrant uh, personnel or even some of those holodeck adventure cards. So again, it just depends on what you're looking for. A lot of people like to do something where you can put as many personnel into play as possible, right? Because obviously the faster you can get your crew built up based off old rules, which was play one card, draw one card, play one card, draw one card, took forever, right? Before you could actually have, took you seven or eight turns just to get a crew and maybe a ship by turn seven where you could actually attempt a mission. Um, but now you can usually get something by turn Maybe turn two that if you're lucky enough, but turn three, usually you're attempting missions at that point. So um, some people like to just dump, as they we call it in the um, competitive world, report salad, where they're just playing five or six cards down a turn as quickly as they can um, so they can start being attempting missions by turn two. Um, but again, you might lack and draw, so you got to figure out how to do that combination. Um, but anyways, that's that's where you really want to focus on. Um, from your, you know, incidents and objectives based off what you're doing. And obviously it's all dependent a little bit too on how that space line is set up, right? Because you may have that mission or that home world that you want to seed your headquarters at because it has to seed at that, that particular home world. But if it's way at the end of the <laughs> space line and the next mission you want to attempt was, you know, on the opposite end, you got to change up your game strategy a little bit. Again, that may be where you're reporting, you know, not just one facility, but two or three facilities. Makes sense. So that's the seed phase. Those are all the things we should think about. Missions, doorways, dilemmas, facility, incident, objectives. Now we get into the draw phase, which is the fun stuff, I think. <laughs> I guess. Yes. <laughs> Again, there's a lot that goes on there. We could have our own separate video. We could write our own book about each of those types of cards and each of why you could do that, right? If you're really talking strategy, but again, we're trying to keep this to about a 35, 40 minute video, if not quicker than that. But the draw phase is you got to have at least 30 cards and you can make the draw deck as big as you want, right? Um, some people like myself, we like to keep them thin because I want to get those cards quickly, right? Because again, you can draw, you know, have two or three John Luke's in your, in your draw deck and that's fine. But the efficiency is, is once I get John Luke into play, hopefully I can keep him into play long enough where I don't have to worry about it. So that extra one I might draw, again, what's the point if I'm never going to play him, right? So rather than having a 60, you know, which most people are used to a 60 card draw deck, I can have it down to 40, 45 cards, not worry about as many duplicates. And that way I'm guaranteeing, okay, I have this nice combination of skills that I need from my personnel and I have a few events or interrupts and some ships that I need to balance out my deck. And, you know, I'm good to go. But on the other hand, some people love to play with 100 to 150, 200 cards in their draw deck. 
Um, a lot of times the Borg, which again, which we weren't going to, you know, go into too much depth here, but some people and most Borg decks are usually 120 plus cards. Um, I have a friend who's played very competitively. He's won nationals. He's won continentals. He's placed high in worlds. He doesn't like to play with anything less than like 120 cards himself because he loves playing this particular card in his draw in his draw deck called handshake, where basically you play handshake, you discard three <coughs> cards from your hand and you draw seven. Right. Um, which in most places, if you're not drawing as many cards as possible, you can't do that whole as that term, that uh, free report salad, as I was saying, we were just putting down as many personnel as possible. But he doesn't care if he's discarding John Luke and William T. Riker and Kira, because he's basically saying, OK, I've got three of them in my deck. I know I'm going to draw them again. So I'll play the ones I need to this turn for my free report side, discard what I need to do, draw back up to seven and then just play that over and over again, right? And he's just laying four or five personal de personnel um, per turn down. So by, like I said, turn two, if not by turn three, he's got a crew of like 10 people and he's going off and attempting missions. So the draw deck is a fine balance. Um, you know, a lot of modern games have done a better job of balancing out where it's not just all, you know, all the characters, right? Essentially, or all the personnel. You need to have a nice combination of if effects, interrupts, events, objectives whatever type of other cards that are in the card game right where it's just not all personnel star trek on the other hand is a little bit different um a lot of decks i would say are probably minimum 50 percent characters if not 75 to 80 percent sometimes even 100 percent all characters because other than a few starships maybe um because a lot of times the cost of playing an event um is the same as it is for personnel and an event can be good, but a lot of times you'd rather have that personnel down because, again, that's how you're going to basically solve dilemmas and, you know, get points from you know, completing missions is getting that personnel into play. Um, if you get the free personnel, you have two or three free plays. Cool. Then you may spend that that actual card play on a ship or you may, you know, place that actual event at that time then to draw some more cards at that point. Or like I said, handshake, which happens to be an incident, you play handshake and then you're drawing your seven cards back up. So um, usually that's what most of those decks are using. Uh, again, you could have some interrupts. Um, they can be very good. They could be cards that could just, you know, prevent somebody from moving this turn. Uh, could be, you know, something where you get some bonus points from doing an objective on the side. Uh, could be all sorts of things. So again, you might see about five to 10 of those, um, you know, maybe 10%, 15% in a deck. Um, and like I said, the rest are basically going to be starships because you want to make sure you get some starships out because that's the only way you're going to be able to travel, even from mission to mission for the most part, other than some crazy Star Trek uh, CCG shenanigans you can do between time locations. Um, or again, if you happen to play like one of the um, decks or affiliations that allows you to seed a starship, most of the time, then then you might be ability to ignore that and not have a starship. Although they may have one in their side deck just in case if one blows up. So, okay, so draw. So you go the smaller deck, but what are some of the other things to kind of be thinking about as you kind of go through this draw phase? So it depends on which thematic verse I'm going into. So let's say, for example, I'm playing what you call a speed solver, right? So I play a speed solver. I need to make sure I have, um, you know, I got to counter kind of what I know is in the meta for dilemmas to be able to pass those dilemmas. And then I know basically what missions I've seeded. So I need to know, okay, I need so much leadership, engineer, and security and integrity, for example, to be able to solve those missions to get to 100 points. So I know, OK, uh, I want to have some extra, you know, engineer, leadership, um, security, those types of things. But I need to make sure I have some of that exobiology, stellar cartography, you know, medical, all those types of things that my opponent may be filtering for in my dilemmas. So I'll come up with a combination of characters. So sometimes that's including unique and universal. Um, universal personnel can be just as good, uh, especially if you have a free report that, let's say, you can't um, you can free report a universal uh, Federation personnel. Okay, cool. Um, then I'll make sure I include those uh, along with the unique ones, right? The main characters that you know by by name. So if I'm doing a speed solver, like I said, I want to make my deck thin, thin and lean and go from there. If I'm wanting to kind of build maybe a mid aggro range deck where I'm kind of, you know, controlling my opponent a little bit, you know, standard terms of what people are doing, probably go around 60 cards. 
um, because I'm going to include some events. I'm going to include some interrupts, right? Besides my personnel, if I'm a little bit slower in getting those personnel out, it's okay because I'm trying to control my opponent enough that I can stall them for three or four turns rather than just trying to quickly outpace them in a speed solver. Um, or then again, sometimes those, um, it could be an aggro deck essentially where you're just going out and you're just going to blow up your opponent's facilities. So, and then they can't report anybody <laughs> and just completely lock them out. So if you're doing that, um, you're going to want to have heavy ships and you're going to have to have plenty of leaders and people to fly those ships. And you're probably going to have plenty of cards that beef up your ship. So you could be looking at some high objectives, incidents, and events that really beef up your ships. Um, and then some interrupts to make sure. And then as I mentioned too, right, you're probably going to be seeing someone seeding the uh, battle bridge deck uh, because they're going to be using tactics. And I want to beef up that, you know, multiple ships and controlling it and making sure that my opponent, you know, surrounding him, if he can't leave, if he's got his home world, I don't really want to attack him in his home world because again, he could defend home world and literally download his entire deck from, from the most part and really have a huge advantage. But as soon as he leaves that, then I want to make sure that I have the ability to stop and, ta and, and take out a ship. So again, you might be running, you know, about 60 to 70 cards in that. And then again, some people, depending on, like I said, your play style and what you want to do um, for your draw engines and or if you're looking for Borg and you just want really large decks, then like I said, you could be, you know, looking at a combination of anything to get to 100 plus cards. Okay, what else? So... Draw phase. I also did not realize there was as much strategy involved. I knew this was a complicated game, but when you start talking about like control, aggro, mid range, I was like, oh, those are concepts that also exist in this game. <laughs> so it's, I know they're universals a little bit, but I just uh, I need to get a little smarter. And this has been a really great tutorial on sort of the deck building strategies and seed and draw. Do you have any kind of final thoughts here as you kind of we kind of wrap up things? Yeah. So again, um, as you're mentioning here for draw deck and what you want to build for your affiliation, right? Um, you can mix affiliations, um, but you have to have like treaties out um, or you have to have some cards that bypass that, um, which is very difficult because if your opponent blows up your treaty, you kind of are playing two separate affiliations that can't mix and you can lock yourself out. Um, but there's some really cool ways of doing that very thematic stuff, especially if you're playing with some of the virtual cards. Um, that the Trek CC did, like there's one, I love the, um, uh, incident or the, the basically uh, play engine from deep space nine, which allows the Cardassians and the Romulans to basically play together from the Tal Shiar and the city in order sense, um, which was very thematic and you could, you know, combine them together and you get some really cool, heavy power armored ships. You can do some capturing, um, you can do some mind probing and controlling them. You can go over to the, uh, gamma quadrant and try to basically blow up the founder's home world um, and solve that mission in a sense so you can do a lot of cool thematic stuff but we could really make almost a video on every affiliation because there's just so many combinations and different things and then some affiliations specifically around like the federation there's sub affiliations or sub factors because you have you know the original series you have the motion picture team uh you have the tng as i mentioned the deep space nine you have the um voyager crew from from delta you have the mirror quadrant um so and then you even have the mirror quadrant tos so <laughs> there's all sorts of things that you really want to try in your draw deck cut it down to one affiliation as best as you can unless if you're playing a couple of the specific um as i mentioned play engines that allow that mixture perfectly fine that right um, you can actually play the one mirror quadrant, um, uh, what's it? The, the Regency one, uh, where it basically allows you to mix all of the, um, mirror people together, which is really cool. So you can have like, you know, six different affiliations, uh, which is really fun. Um, or you can have the, uh, dogs of war, which was staging ground, which is really nice. Um, which allows you the alpha quadrant four quad, uh, treaty, uh, which allows you to do feds um the bajorans the romulans and the klingons and that's a lot of fun as well uh so you can do you know all sorts of stuff but again you're limited uh but again that's that's you know one of the things that we could do many videos on that as well uh but again that's what you really want to focus on within your deck is hey what personnel and you know what affiliation i'm sticking with even what potentially time period or quadrant am i sticking with and then really what am i trying to accomplish right because you could pollute your draw deck with all sorts of stuff, but you really want to make it fine tuned as best as possible. Again, 60 cards is perfectly fine. Um, but again, based off your play style, you may want to have a smaller deck um, where you're really focused on getting those specific cards out or maybe a larger deck, depending on how you want to cycle through it. Okay. Um, I think we might 
do a deck video on some specific strategies here down the road. Uh, this has kind of piqued my interest in thinking about some some ways to present specific strategies. Um, maybe if you've made it to the 40-minute mark, mark at this point, then hats off to you. you. You've learned a lot about how to improve your Star Trek CCG game. Um, so I, I think for me, I, I'm kind of just sitting here and, and realizing that I've bitten off more than I can chew with thinking that we could do this in like 15 minutes. <laughs> so Derek, I really appreciate all the information you provided. Uh, any any kind of final thoughts here as we as we wrap up and uh, let people go back to their normal lives? <laughs> no, like I said, it's it's a lot of fun. I recommend anyone that wants to play it download the virtual TNG decks. Um, it's a simple sixty card deck total between your draw deck and your dilemma, uh, or I'm sorry, C deck. Um, it's really balanced. There's affiliation based, and they're really good with playing each other. So if somebody wants to play Fed. You know, Romulan, Klingon, Ferengi, the Cardassians, um, really good stuff from the, the next generation. It's a great uh, way to start and very cheap. The other thing I'll note is that this is all available online to, to print and play. So check out the Star Trek CC website. I'll leave a link in the video description here so folks can find that. I should have said that at minute one, but here we are. That's okay. We'll, we'll put it in the in the uh, comment box. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks for hanging out, Derek. And we'll catch everybody next time.